I'm Rajesh Baskaran. I run the Swanson Engineering Simulation Program at Cornell University. Um, and uh, the program is geared towards bringing in cutting edge simulation technology into engineering education. And I'm John Swanson. I'm one of the pioneers of finite element simulation. Uh, I started the ANSYS software program many years ago. And Rajesh wants to sort of ask me questions about how that came about. So here's the first question. What were the early years of uh, finite element analysis and simulation like? Well, the simulation has gone hand in hand with computer technology. So part of the question, answer is, of course, what was computer technology like? And back then, computing was done with large mainframes computing. Uh, the source code was on punch card decks. Uh, you got one or two turnarounds a day if you were lucky. Uh, a deck of cards for software might be 100 or 200,000 cards. Um, the prototype or the, the most desirable engineering computing uh, became the mini computer, the VAX 11780, whose speed was a nice steady one megaflop. Uh, today's computing, of course, is up into gigaflop, teraflops, and so on. But one megaflop was a nice machine at that point. And what were some? What are some of the early stories that stick in your mind? Well, that's that's a, a pretty general uh, question. Um, the shuttle launch. Okay, the shuttle launch story. The uh, it was early in the morning of the first shuttle launch, and I got a very early call, and the question was heat transfer. The object was the shuttle tiles, and the desire was to do a three-dimensional simulation. Uh, because they'd only done one-dimensional simulations, and they really wanted to have a little more assurance because they were launching within hours. <laughs> and um, what, how did you get the idea to start the ANSYS program? Well, the ANSYS program started uh, because I had a problem that I needed a solution. The problem was a simple stress concentration problem in an axisymmetric structure, and there was no tools for doing that. So I developed a network of springs to simulate the stress concentration, and I got what looked like plausible results. And so I showed them to our uh, government sponsors on the particular project, and they said, hey, that looks like what Ed Wilson is doing out at the University of California. Why don't you go talk to him? And so I went to talk to Ed Wilson, and he had written a axisymmetric finite element program. Um, and so I worked all evening and into the night writing up the coding for the punch cards for that particular problem. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, I found someone who could punch the cards, feed them into the computer. And by 5 o'clock, I had a really good-looking solution. It was all numbers on paper. And by 7 o'clock, I had a big box of cards under my arm, and I was heading back toward the airport. And I, of course, rewrote the whole thing as was what I want. But that was my first interest in finite element analysis, was to solve that simple stress concentration problem. Now, as and I, which year was you know that? Which year was that? That would have been 1964, probably. Let's bend it down to 64, maybe 65. And then um, how, how did, uh, you know, I well, suppose it was 100 in 1970, so. Yeah, yeah uh, as I went from the, that period on, I began adding more and more capability. Uh, that was two-dimensional axisymmetric. I added shells, I added solids, I did, added dynamics, and I had separate programs for shells, for solids, and so on. And I began to realize I was doing the same thing over and over again. All I was doing was changing the element type. So I said, well, I can put together one software package where you can just specify which element type and save myself a lot of work. And that was the basis for the program that eventually evolved into ANSYS. Uh, that program was done on a government contract and became public domain. Uh, ANSYS, of course, picked up from that and went on. And how did you distribute the first version of ANSYS? Well, the first version was what done in what was called time sharing. Uh, we mounted the program on a computer, and then you would sign up to buy time on the computer. Uh, you would pay for the cost of the computing time with a surcharge for running ANSYS. Now we looked at several different pricing mechanisms. We did a pricing per degree of freedom or a pricing per element. Uh, 
but eventually the computing time became the common uh, theme. As we went into the mini computers and smaller computers, then we just started charging a fixed fee. And then eventually that evolved into a seat fee, in other words, you know, so much for each user. And you know, pricing has always been an issue. Uh, our pricing originally was based on the speed of the machine. The more faster the machine, the more expensive the pricing. Now, of course, we had the advantage that the machines got faster and faster and faster, so the price kept going up and up and up. And so every, every year or so, I cut the price in half. And everybody loves a price cut. <laughs> yeah, so you know, you know, that, that, that worked out well for all concerned. And um, um, how, um, so what was meshing like? in the first version of ah, ANSYS. First version, well, let's go back. Can to, import, right? <laughs> no, no, let's go, let, let's go back to Aerojet and, uh, and Wilson. The, when I wrote up my simple problem, the mesh generation was you could specify node one and node five and fill in between. And then you could generate node six and node 10 and fill in in between. And then you could generate element number one from six to five to 10 to two and make five of those, incrementing by one. You know, that was the uh, mesh generation. Uh, after that, I generated a series of mesh generators for shells and solids, and mesh te generation technology now is much, much advanced. You, know, you can do huge three-dimensional solid models in you know, minutes uh, using bricks or tetrahedrons. It's, yeah, meshing is not an issue anymore, whereas it used to be the issue. Uh, you would spend days, weeks, or even months doing a mesh for say an automobile engine. Now you take the CAD part, you just say mesh all with this size, and you get these huge models, which with today's computing technology run in minutes or hours. Vast changes from both in individual productivity and in computing productivity. And uh, what did the graphical user, how did the graphical user interface come about and how oh, did hey, they evolve? Hey, my first paper, I, I had done a plain section of a hexagon with some holes in it. And I printed out the stresses at every point in a rectangular lattice. And then I drew lines for where the holes were. And then I took my colored pencils and I said, well, the thousand degree contour, or thousand contour will go here and over here. And here's a 1250 contour here and so on. And that's the figure in my published paper is this grid of numbers with these lines drawn uh, to, you know. Then we got graphic terminals. And the first graphic terminals were the Tektronics green, green line on green screen. And so we drew line drawings, the storage tube technology. So a moving light left an image on the phosphor screen. And I was at a technical conference one time, it was the end of the day, we'd had a show, I had one of these display tubes. And this particular device when it wasn't being used, it would run a colored rectangle to just keep the screen uniformly refreshed. And you know, we were so tired at the end of the day, I had a crowd of people sitting behind me watching the line go back <laughs> and forth and back and forth. Uh, th then we got uh, raster technology, where you've got every pixel, uh, black and white first. So you got, you know, th that was easy because you just took your figure you had on your vector screen and you made a black and white image. You know, straightforward. So then they came out with color screens, color raster screens. I said, oh, I'll color the lines. And I did, and I looked at it and said, well, that's not very interesting. It looks <laughs> pretty much the same as it was before. I said, uh, I wonder what would happen if I colored the spaces in between the lines. And I did that. It, was, it, you know, it took me 10 minutes or so to change the color. And up came the picture. And I said, bingo, that new technology. You know, that, that it, it popped. You, know, you could just see everything. It, it, it's the standard contour display now. But it was the, the change from the color of the line to fill the spaces that made all the difference. Mm -hmm. And how did the educational program start? I mean, how did you get to... Well, the educational program you know, was my idea. And it was the only idea I ever had that got vetoed by my advisory group, which was my managers. They were to a person. Yeah, I won't say to a man because I had you know, equal number of men and women, but to a person, they said, you're a bad idea, you're going to compete with the industry, you're going to compete with our consultants. You're going to... I said, no, we're doing it anyway. And it is the only time I ever overruled, you know, you know, I had unanimous opposition 
and I said we're going to do it anyway. The first price on the uh, educational version was one dollar uh, because basically I wanted to support education. Which uh, year was that? The early 1980s, oh. uh, as close as I can pin it down. The uh, a year or so later, I raised the price to a hundred dollars because I wanted the university to sign on for security purposes, not just the individual professor. Uh, one person screamed bloody murder because I raised the price by a factor of 100. <laughs> <laughs> but ever since then, the, the answer software has been widely used in education. I think there's, what's the last number, 2,000 universities yes, worldwide yeah. uh, use ANSYS. And uh, one of the stories that go along with that, the, the, my marketing manager was a woman, but her husband, who was a man, uh, worked at United States Steel, and he was head of the computer center. So he was at IBM, you know, you know, meetings about computing. And he was walking down the corridor, and he looks into an office, and there's a whole row of ANSYS manuals. And so he said, you know, what's that? He said, well, we, we hired this guy from the university, and he said, you know, here I am, where's ANSYS? <laughs> and, you know, IBM became one of our bigger customers. But it was from the educational program, from the person that says, I know how to do simulation. I use ANSYS, and away we go. So it's, it's a good business strategy as well as a good educational strategy. And uh, what was, uh, what is your educational background and how did it prepare you? Cornell at the time was a five-year program. Uh, my scholarship was a National Merit Scholarship. It covered four years. Uh, I'm always grateful that Cornell came up with the money for the additional year plus money for a half year to get my master's degree. Then I went off to work for Westinghouse in Pittsburgh on the nuclear rocket program. I was there only uh, six months when my manager said to me, I need to put somebody in for the PhD program. Uh, I said, okay, sure. And <laughs> yeah. a couple of months later, they said, yeah, you're in. Uh, so at that point, I went to night school at the University of Pittsburgh for three years, for three courses per trimester, three trimesters a year. Uh, got my, and you were also developing ANSYS code at this uh, time? No, at that point, yes. I, was at working, I was working on boundary point collocation methods because um, I got my PhD degree in 1966 and so I had gotten into an early finite element work but I had been doing boundary point collocation and work as well so there was an overlap there. The, uh, I worked at Westinghouse for another three years after that. The program was showing signs of, shall I say, defunding. Uh, it was a government program and the, the handwriting was on the wall besides which I was much more interested in doing finite element work than I was in managing my stress group. My management philosophy was if my in-basket got too high, somebody would come and tell me what was important and I didn't <laughs> have to deal with that. So I often claimed that my departure was a safety measure because it was high enough to collapse on me <laughs> and kill me. I, I went out looking for a job that would pay me what I wanted to be paid, namely aerospace wages, to do what I wanted to do, namely develop software. I could not find both, so I started my own company, which was Swanson Analysis Systems, uh, eventually to become ANSYS Incorporated. So how long was that before, you know, you, um, after you came out of Westinghouse and you were getting, you know, you were selling the software? Well, the, I came out of Westinghouse. And getting aerospace wages, I guess. Uh, well, it took a long time for that. <laughs> uh, the funding originally was from my own investments. That was $1,282, 12, as I recall. That was for office space. But I did consulting for Westinghouse uh, to earn the money to pay for the computer time at United States Steel to develop the software, which by the end of the next year, I was licensing back to, Anson, to Westinghouse. <laughs> uh, so Westinghouse was my major support and uh, one of my first customers. So Westinghouse has been good to me, and uh, I think I've done good things for them as well. And... Uh... Um, why do you keep supporting Cornell Engineering still? Well, Cornell is a good school. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I, I'm in the phase of life now where I'm doing outgo as opposed to income. And so most of my work these days is charitable work. And Cornell is obviously a good place to do that work, uh, both with the engineering school, myself, and the veterinary school, which is what Janet does her support at. So my wife is uh, actively involved in philanthropy as well. And our objective is to give it all away and to die at the same time, so it all comes out even. <laughs> yeah. But as I pointed yes. out last night, you know, we're not going to do that. We're staying. We're not going. Yes. 
that's the way we want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> and what do you see as the future of uh, simulation? Well, yeah, simulation is great because it keeps evolving and changing. You know, at our meeting today, we were talking about you know, worldwide networks and, and sim cafe and so on. And you know, we really don't know where that's going to go. You'll, you'll see the notes you know, yeah. on that subject. But uh, you know, simulation is enormous as far as the market, as far as the impact on engineering. As you're aware, I got the John Fritz Medal for, and that's the top engineering award in the country. And that was based not just on what I did, but what simulation has done. Yeah. You know, our products are better, our products are higher quality, our products are faster to market. All those things come from simulation. You know, so, uh, so I said, do I really deserve this award? And I talked to my good friend Bill Jones. And he said, John, if they offer you an award, take it. <laughs> so I did. <laughs>